morning, friends. Lovely to see you all this morning. A lot of you were here yesterday. Uh, we celebrated the life of Dillis Sosted here. Um, beautiful celebration of Dillis's life. And uh, I am hopeful that uh, the energy and the presence of all those folks who were here, uh, Dillis included, is still kind of wafting in this place, and we are feeling the goodness of it. Uh, I, uh, Carla, in a moment, will, of course, do our broad welcome, but I particularly want to say a word of welcome to Chris Lovelidge, who's uh, here with us this morning and who has graciously and generously offered to share his story of a... <laughs> no. I'm going to say it, of a near-death experience. We're just really grateful that you, um, for your willingness to come and speak with us this morning, Chris. Chris is uh, no stranger, especially to those of you who either live in the atrium or work in the thrift shop. So he's one of our thrift shop volunteers, and we're just really grateful that you're here, and we're looking forward to, to hearing from you. Uh, as always, lots of announcements, and lots of these announcements, in my estimation, are exciting announcements because they are an indication of the way that we continue to be opening up, right, after being closed down for um, many of our activities for so long. So the Deep Cove Coffee House is back, yay, and uh, that will be happening here on Friday night of this week, and the Deep Cove Coffee House is a uh, a fundraiser for the church, so we have an arrangement with them uh, in which the mus musicians receive some of the take at the door, and the church receives a portion of that as well. So really want to encourage you to come out and support the musicians and to support the church at the same time. Uh, lots of you came on Monday night to hear uh, Wade Lef Lifton kind of walk us through in a uh, and close to our own death and to imagine what a good death would be like for us. And uh, in that uh, series, that, that two-part series that we're having, there will be another opportunity to come together and to talk about death on Wednesday, May the 25th. And that will be um, more of an unscripted conversation. And so we will talk about whatever the gathered community wants to talk about. And it may be that some of you who were here on Monday night um, had some things evoked for you that you want to come and talk about, and you are welcome to do that on the 25th. The other thing that's happening that has not happened for two years is the annual church picnic. One of my favorite days of the year. Uh, we've got Peter and Ellen Muirhead lined up to uh, do the food for us. We have uh, usually done that in a potluck fashion, at least mo a portion of that um, picnic has been potluck. This year, uh, we've asked Ellen and Peter just to put the, put the barbecue on for us and the salads so that uh, there will be a little bit, uh, a greater level of safety in our sharing that together. So it's on Sunday, June the 5th. It's uh, Pentecost Sunday, so the end of the Easter season, and it also um, happens to be Anne Ellis's last Sunday with us before she heads off for um, some further study in her preparations for ordination and, uh, and then eventually to a uh, supervised ministry experience somewhere other than here. And so we really want to encourage people to come on that day. There will also be folks youth and adults who are joining the church on that day and um, I know that that's going to be a really important day in the life of this community of faith. Anne's been with us for a long time. We're going to be sad to um, see her go and so that will be opportunity for us that day to, to, um, to, to, uh, for us to give her our blessings before she heads off. Uh, oh, sign up. Yep, thank you. <laughs> Great minds. <laughs> Uh, there is a sign-up sheet for the picnic that day, so we have some sense of about how much food we need to order. The sign-up sheet is out on uh, that, what we call the action table, out in the lobby it, where the sermons are printed and left. Uh, please just put your name there and how many people are in your party so that we know how many hot dogs, hamburgers, and veggie burgers we need to order for that day. Uh, I think the only other thing I want to say is about the offering. 
Uh, we are still not passing the plates on Sunday morning, but the offering box is at the back of the church, so if you wish to make a financial offering to the church today for the life and work of the church, you are welcome to do that, and there's some envelopes in the pews if you are wanting to have an income tax receipt for that to um, let us know your address, and we'll get that to you. I think those are all of the things I need to say for the good of the church. Is there anything else that needs to be brought to our attention? We begin. The welcome that we extend here at Mount Seymour is as broad and as deep as we can make it. So you are welcome here no matter how old or young you are, wherever you are on your faith journey. You're welcome here no matter what your marital status, your sexual orientation, your gender identity or expression. You're welcome here no matter what your ethnic or cultural heritage is, whether you call yourself a Christian or you're part of another faith tradition or you're someone who seeks to explore the mysteries of life, and serve the ideals of compassion and justice and peace. And as a reconciling people of Christ, we, each time we gather here in this place, we remember that we are gathered on the traditional and unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, in particular the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the tsleil nations. And when we gather, we, we acknowledge and recognize that the relationship that has been broken in the past and continues to be, and we pray for God to guide us in ways of right relationship with our indigenous neighbors. The season of Easter, the season that stretches all the way from Easter Sunday through to Pentecost Sunday, 50 days in this great season, it is all about uh, reflecting on living on the other side of death. People who have had a near-death experience know all about what it is to live on the other side of of death. A brush with death can dramatically change the way that we choose to live our lives on this side of the grave. Death can be transformative. It can make us new. It can make all of life new.
Let's be together as a people of prayer. Resurrecting one, you who makes all things new, as we come into your presence now, meet us in the places we are still waiting for life to arise. Visit us with your forgiveness, peace, and healing. Revitalize our hearts and refresh our souls that we might rise up with the courage of the risen Christ and go where we are called. Amen. just a day or a season. It's a way of being in the world. The more we see Christ in the faces of strangers and friends, the more hope we notice springing up around us, the more courage we observe in the midst of despair, the more forgiveness and kindness we experience in times of division, the more able we are to be an Easter people. So let's take a moment now in silence to consider ways that we have witnessed life and love flourishing this week. Christ has risen. Christ is risen indeed. And now I'd like to invite you 
to share the peace with one another by a bow or a, or a prayer hands or a wave. Just turn to your neighbor and, and uh, share the peace of Christ with each other. Imagine once we let you get up and around how long that's going to be. The first week we do it, we're in trouble. <laughs> Super spreader. Super spreader events. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, so during the season of Easter, we have been singing weekly, we've been singing the Lord's Prayer. And it's uh, for a, a way for the children to learn the Lord's Prayer. And uh, so after we are finished singing, the children will leave um, to go with Anne and, and have some time um, with, in the children's community with Anne. So uh, we are going to sing the Lord's Prayer. The scripture reading this morning comprises selections from the first 44 verses of chapter 11 of the Gospel according to John. Whether you take what is written in the Bible as fact, metaphor, myth, or story, listen to these words now for the meaning they hold for you on this day. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. It was her brother, Lazarus, who was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love, is ill. Jesus was some distance away when he received the message and stayed several days longer in the place where he was. Then he said to his disciples, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was referring to merely being asleep. 
Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. When Jesus arrived in Bethany, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Then Jesus, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against the entrance. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha said to him, Lord, already there is an odor because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. May the Spirit bless us with wisdom and wonder as we ponder the meaning of these words for our lives. So that story of the raising of Lazarus is uh, only found in John's Gospel. And uh, we've been looking at John's Gospel a little bit the last few weeks and uh, know that it's full of all kinds of symbolism. Uh, you might even, uh, in your listening today, have heard the echoes of Jesus' death, right? The stone that's in front of the tomb that gets rolled away. And so there's something about this story, I think, that uh, talks to us about how whatever that mysterious thing is that happened with Jesus, it's also something that happens in all of us, and it can happen on this side of the grave, as it did for Lazarus. And uh, an interesting thing about this story is that in John's Gospel, this is the story that sets the authorities on edge and they start to really seek to uh, do away with Jesus in earnest. Because if uh, the voice of love has such capacity to change us and transform us in a way that raises us up out of places of death, then imagine what that power can do in the world, changes lives. So we're so grateful to have Chris here today. Uh, not everyone, not all of us is going to have a near-death experience. Uh, Chris has had that. It changed his life. And we invite you to come and talk to us about it now, Chris. We're eager to hear you. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. Everything you said about the near-death experience is true. I want you to know that. <sighs> Be with me. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all. It's really great to be here. I want to thank Nancy for inviting me to talk about my most amazing profound and transcendental experience. That was very brave of you. You don't know what I'm gonna say. <laughs> I'll behave myself. Also, there may be tears as I recount the experience. It was so profound and moving 
This is quite remarkable, as it happened to me over 50 years ago, and I still remember almost every visual and emotional detail clearly. So my talk today is on the subject of the near-death experience. This is encouraging. Nobody's left yet. I must emphasize that I'm not asking you to believe me. I have no right to do that. This was a highly personal and moving experience. And anyway, I could be wrong. I don't believe I am, but I could be. So what is a near-death experience, or NDE as it's called? It has been defined as an altered, transformed, or higher state of consciousness apart from the body, but it is much more than that. It is a state of mind or alternative reality in which the consciousness appears to have the ability to move freely beyond the physical body and enter what I believe is another or higher dimension. Other accounts are remarkably consistent in character and similar in content. About 19 different aspects have been identified by researchers. This is not a religious experience. It is a spiritual experience, numinous experience. It is also a most natural phenomena. My story begins one afternoon in the summer of 1973. I was living in Oakville, Ontario at the time. I was at a barbecue in charge of cooking and we had decided to have prawns. I tasted a prawn before it was properly cooked. I soon discovered it was tainted with tomain food poisoning. Not good. I felt the effects about an hour later with my stomach ache, then quickly progressed to pain. Then some six hours later, I was in bed writhing in excruciating agony. About one o'clock in the morning, the pain very suddenly stopped. To be, here we go. To be replaced with the most profound, amazing, indescribable feeling of love, peace, tranquility, joy, ecstasy. It was ineffable beyond the limits of language to describe. It was, I think, the peace that passes all understanding. At the same time, I found myself in another place, literally a change of scenery. I was in a surreal, heavenly pastoral scene, standing on top of a low hill covered with grass and a few trees, looking down onto a shallow valley. There was a fence running along the bottom of the valley with square posts, two horizontal bars. About a hundred meters away from me along the hill were a group of about 20 people. Close enough to determine they were human, but too far away to recognize as individuals. Most astounding were three figures standing right in front of me. Beings of light. They all wore hooded robes with a bright white radiance emanating from where their faces and hands should be. Sorry. <laughs> I'm back there. I realized I was standing in the presence of unconditional love, and I was feeling it. They identified themselves, one was the spirit of Jesus, the other Jeremiah, and the third a guardian angel. I call them spirit guides. The term is synonymous. A large number of experiences have reported meeting the spirit of Jesus, so it's not unusual, particularly with children. I stood with these beings for some time, I guess about 15 minutes or more, we communicated by thought, and certain information was impressed upon me. 
It is strange I was unable to remember any of the contents of this communication until some time later, when I started to remember some of this information. This is also common. It can take up to three or four years for this to process, for, to process the experience. It is like you know something, but you don't realize you know it until you see or hear it. Then it all comes back, a kind of trigger. I think we all know about that. When I returned to the pain, I sat bolt upright and hugged my wife, saying, don't leave me, don't leave me. They sent me back because you weren't with me. I still don't know what that means. Had they sent me back home? Then I thought, actually, while I was there, I was home. It certainly felt like it. At the time I was basking in this incredible loving radiance, I was conscious, aware, I had intent, I was sentient, lucid, and could think critically. In other words, I retained my personality, my memory, my thoughts, opinions, all that makes my character and persona, all whilst my body was lying in bed. I think the same goes for anyone whose body dies. Everything feels the same. They literally don't know their bodies are dead. This near-death experience frightened the life out of me. I was convinced I had developed a psychosis. After all, this was not normal and I was waiting with trepidation for the next episode. It never arrived. Then sometime later, I heard a book being reviewed on the CBC radio entitled Life After Life by Raymond Moody. I purchased the book and read it in two days. The relief was wonderful. This book did two things for me. It confirmed I was not crazy after all, but more important, I was not the only one to have this experience. I was not alone. Research has shown about 5% of the population have had a near-death experience. That's millions of people. 10% have had an out-of-body experience, the first stage of the NDE. 98% lose their fear of death. I'm not too sure about the other 2%. Where were they? Anyway. Um, I suggest that when you lose your fear of death, you lose your fear of living. 96% return not believing in God, but knowing in God. It is known as the gnosis. I know with absolute and total certainty that the divine exists. The NDE has been recorded throughout history, including Pope Gregory VIII and Plato, to name a few. All those who have an NDE are changed in some manner, psychologically and physically, always it seems for the better. The immediate effect was to change my worldview, my, my paradigm. I saw the big picture, as it were, the nature of the universe and the nature of the divine. It took me some time to process experience more fully, several years in fact, not uncommon. Then I began to realize something was missing. I returned for a reason, I think to help take away the fear. And what is man's greatest fear? The unknown, death. I should be doing something else, I thought. Something altruistic, helping others. It was then that I volunteered uh, as a hospital visitor, assisting those incapacitated, reading to them, feeding them. I realized I just loved it. I soon volunteered as a crisis line worker with my wife, 
which took about 40 hours of training. These people are serious about who they let loose on the public. We did that for seven years. Not content with that, I then did training to become a hospice volunteer, a further 50 hours of training. <clears throat> I actually volunteered with two other hospices. My NDE credentials gave me particularly useful skills for tending to those near physical death. I had no baggage to impede me. I loved my time with hospice. It was a great privilege and honor to be able to minister and support the dying and talk about what was important to them. I was often asked what these people, why these, sorry, I often asked what these people say when I tell them about my NDE. The answer is, I didn't. I am there to support the client. It is not about me, it is about them. There was only one occasion when I did, and only because I was asked to. I will always remember this gentleman because he felt op comfortable opening up to me. One day he told me about a very strange incident he experienced that he had never told anyone, not even his wife. He was walking in a country lane on a sunny day in Ontario. The ambulance was very serene, warm sun, cool breeze, when he looked to his left and was astounded to see himself walking next to himself. You've got to think about that. <laughs> he was having an out-of-body experience. He wasn't frightened, just surprised. I told him that was wonderful, and it showed him that he was more than his body. It was then that he asked me if I had experienced something like that. So I told him my story. I could see the relief on his face. I later ran a self-help group under the auspices of the International Association for Near-Death Studies. It's for those having an NDE or other transcendental experiences who need to talk and to, and to process that experience. And there were some incredible stories about what happened and what people have experienced. Things like bilocation, materialization, Amazing. There are indications that the NDE can alter the physical body as well as psychologically. Here's a few. Loss of the fear of death. More spiritual, less religious. Easily engaged in abstract thinking. More philosophical. Can go through various bouts of depression. More generous and charitable than before form expansive concept of love while at the same time challenged to initiate and maintain satisfying relationships. Less competitive, convinced of life's purpose, rejection of previous limitations on life and normal role playing, heightened sensation of taste, touch, texture, smell, increased intuitive psychic abilities, more detached and objective, hunger for knowledge and learning highly curious. Some experiences seem to influence electronics. They can't wear a watch because they keep stopping. Also, enhanced intelligence. I know that didn't happen to me because I still have trouble finding my socks in the morning. <laughs> Darn it, anyway. There are many examples of the body being preserved or protected during an NDE. A woman fell out of her canoe whilst negotiating some rapids and was underwater for about half an hour. She had an NDE during this time and was finally rescued. She should have been brain damaged, but she suffered no ill effects. There is another amazing, astounding example of enhanced abilities during the NDE. I love this story. This is about Vicky, who I've met twice, so her story was first-hand for me. 
These NDEs show two amazing aspects of this phenomena. Vicky was involved in a terrible car accident and was brought to hospital unconscious. She was taken immediately to the operating room to save her life. When she was in the ICU, she recounted her experience on the operating table, telling her surgeons where they and their nurses were standing, description of the tools they were using, equipment, and some of the conversations. The surgeons were absolutely astounded and amazed and were so impressed, they actually arranged to sign an affidavit of this story. The reason for this excitement? Vicky had been light blind from birth and had never seen anything in her life. <sighs> I love it. Another example is where a patient in hospital was having an operation during which she had an NDE. When she recovered, she reported leaving her body and floating outside the hospital. Looking back, she noticed a pair of sneakers on the ledge, three stories up, not visible from the ground, or from inside the hospital. When the staff looked, they found the sneakers just as the patient described. This clearly shows the consciousness is capable of leaving the body and bringing back correct data. This is an important thing. It is interesting to note the NDE of suicides. The belief that they go into the dark or what could be termed as hell is just not supported by these reports. Instead, they seem to be accepted, the higher levels of consciousness with love, compassion and understanding, which is understandable knowing the nature of the divine. Many of these people return determined to continue their lives being useful. Evidence suggests that there is a criterion to determine where your soul ends up after physical death. It seems to depend on your attitude to your fellow man, woman, person. If you are kind, considerate, compassionate, useful, and do good, it seems you go to the higher levels where I went, this what we call summer land. It's a pastoral area. If not, you go to the darker levels with like-minded souls. I feel the NDE is more about living than dying. Most lives, as we know, are changed for the better. Looking back, I realized the experience was an incredible blessing and it left me in awe and deep, deep gratitude. I also had the feeling that I didn't belong down here, which I mentioned before. And as I say, I believe nobody does. We all belong in the higher dimensions. Call it heaven if you will. And here's something I would like you to think about and ponder. We are, each of us, every one of us, a powerful spiritual being having a human experience. Then we come to the present day. I'm a volunteer at the thrift shop where I do testing and hanging up all kinds of stuff on the walls, pictures, shelves, lots of shelves, racks, hooks, signs, anything that my dear boss Alexis wants me to do. <laughs> Sometime after my NDE, I got to thinking just what happened to me and how. So I decided to undertake some informal research on the subject. After a few years and meeting the most amazing people, doctors, scientists, researchers, I did find out, at least to my satisfaction, but that, my friends, is another story. Thank you. Appreciate it. Whew. Guess you're right here. Sorry about the interruptions, but I can't help it. 
Thank you, Nancy. take a moment to say thank you to you Chris again uh, for your humility and your vul vulnerability and your honesty of sharing so grateful for that uh, we have made a donation to the North Shore Hospice Society in gratitude uh, for your time with us today Yes, I was, that was the next thing that was about to come right out of my mouth. You anticipated it. Uh, um, to say that uh, Chris will stay around after the service, so he'll be in here. If you have some more questions or things that you want to share, uh, he'll host a little time in here after, uh, after service. Thanks, Chris. Okay, and now here's the other thing I want to say. I'm looking out the window to make sure she can't hear us. Uh, June 5th. Anne's last day. Uh, we are collecting funds for a gift for her. And so if you want to make a, um, a financial offering for a gift for Anne, please put it in one of the envelopes that are in your pew. There's some at the back in the offering box. Just put Anne on it and uh, we'll make sure it gets directed to the right place. You can also e-transfer Jen in the office, say it's for Anne or drop off a check or cash and uh, we'll let you know the gift that we're giving her when she finds out on June 5th. Okay, I think that's it.
join together in prayer. This is the Easter season, the celebration of resurrection, the festival of hope, the promise of new beginnings, the dance of faith, song of joy, and the hymn of love. In a world that's sometimes scary and confusing, we come here to find sanctuary. In a world that is full of tragedy and pain and brokenness, we come here to encounter ways of experiencing new life. In a society that abuses power so readily, we come here to weave ourselves into the circle of God's all-encompassing love. God of peace and justice, we pray for the people of Ukraine that they will experience new life in the midst of the destruction of war. And we pray for Russia and all those who are abusing power and causing the oppression of others. We pray that they experience new life in the form of a transformation of their hearts. We pray for other places where there's conflict. We pray for Israel and Palestine, that they may know peace. We pray for the safety of journalists who report the truth and risk their lives for it. We pray especially for the family of Palestinian journalist Shireen Abu Akleh, who was killed this week. We pray for the community in the downtown east side, for the homeless, and for the ones providing care and safety. We pray for First United Church and for the work that continues there and pray that they receive ongoing support to continue their essential care. We pray for understanding and softening of the hearts of those who act in violent ways. And we pray for the communities who are impacted by these violent acts. We pray for those who need to be reminded of the wideness of your love and mercy. We pray for those who are, are grieving and whose loved ones have died. Surround Dillis Sosted's family and friends with your love and care in these days as grief returns close to the surface. We pray for Marty and Stan on the death of their brother-in-law Harry this week. And we continue to pray for those who are near to our hearts. We pray for Pat Dickey, for Alan Johnston, for Barb Algerius, for Nancy and Andrew Stonkus, for Michael Andrews, and for Gwen Kendrick. We pray for all who are in hospital and recovering from illness. And now we pray for others who are on our hearts and in our minds, who we name now. Help us, O oh God, to continue to unleash your resurrecting power in all places where there is need of new life, in all places of hurt and sorrow, division, death, and destruction, injustice, and illness. In the name of the risen one, we pray for healing, justice, for peace, and for great love. We trust that you, O oh God, the source of all life, know all the prayers of our hearts, and that the spirit breath of God flows from within us outward as a spirit of compassion and gracious presence. Amen.
has reminded us that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. He's spoken to our call in life, our call to live out of the love in which we were created, to be a forgiving and gracious and justice-seeking people. And so as we leave this place this day, may we carry that truth deep within our souls, and may we live out of the divinity that is within each and every one of us. Let's bless each other now with these words. <laughs> Amen. 